I will continue, if I may, to page 67 from the idea report, paragraph 163. Hamas conducted much of its fighting during the Gaza operation from bases within private residences and public facilities, which Hamas assumed the IDF would be reluctant to attack. As documented further in section below, Hamas's main base of operations during the Gaza operation was located inside Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. This is what the Israelis say. Paragraph 164. Similarly, Hamas abused the protection according to places of worship, making a practice of storing weapons in mosques. During the Gaza operation, IDF found repeated and conclusive evidence of such use. For instance, the photograph will demonstrate IDF forces discovered weapons in a mosque in, in Jabalia. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 photos there. Yes. <sighs> the first answer to it would be planted. But that, of course, that's, that's not more reaction. Uh, that's the standard answer to someone who wishes to uh, dispute it. Yes. Um, I'm reading on from paragraph 165, R.A., a Hamas activist, another Hamas activist uh, who was arrested by the idea. He continues, um, revealed his knowledge of Hamas, Hamas storage places for weapons, including the houses of activists. Next page, page 68, tunnels, orchards, and mosques. In particular, he indicated that Salah al-Din Mosque served as a storage site for rockets and weapons. To the point that uh, when these uh, places were attacked, there were secondary explosions, as in paragraph 166. Paragraph 167. Uh, IYH, a resident of Beit Hanun, told IDF, um, at, uh, that's paragraph 167, third line, IYH told IDF investigators about Hamas training camp in Khan Yunis that was located in a sports complex behind the Omar Ibn Abdul Aladis Mosque, across from the municipality, as well as rocket firing from the group in the area of Beit Hanum and Tunnel Dark in the area of Khanunis. He also revealed knowledge of a laboratory for manufacturing explosives and rockets located in the civil administration complex of the Jabalia refugee. Uh, the, the, the relevant parts to my submission in both reports I have underlined. Uh, I hope the underlining appears in your honor's uh, copy of the bundle. So, um, to uh, not go on and on over a point that I hope has been made, may I now turn specifically to the both report and the answer to it. I'm at page 15 of my submission. Uh, subsequent to the uh, Goldstone report, um, Richard Goldstone wrote two articles, one in the Washington Post and one in the New York Times. So I will first refer to the uh, Washington Post article. Now that can be found at bundle number five at page 219. These were both subsequent to the Goldman report and subsequent to the Goldstone report. This is from Richard Goldstone. Uh, the article appeared in the uh, Washington Post. Title, Reconsidering the Goldstone Report on Israel and War Crimes. Now, we know a lot more today about what happened in the Gaza War of 2008-2009 than we did when I chaired the fact-finding mission appointed by the UN Human Rights Council that produced what has come to be known as the Goldstone Report. If I had known then what I know now, the Goldstone Report would have been a different document. The final report by the UN Committee of Independent Experts found that Israel had dedicated significant resources to investigate over 400 allegations of operational misconduct in Gaza, while the de facto authority, Hamas, had not conducted any investigations into the launching of rockets and mortars against Israel. Our report found evidence of potential war crimes and possible crimes, possibly crimes against humanity by both Israel and Hamas. That was that the crimes allegedly committed by Hamas were intentional, goes without saying. 
These rockets were purposefully and indiscriminately aimed at civilian targets. The most, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the next page, page 220, second paragraph. For example, the most serious attack the Goldstone Report focused on was the killing of some 29 members of the Al Samuni family in their home. The shelling of the home was apparently the consequence of an Israeli commander's erroneous interpretation of a drone image. And an Israeli officer is under investigation for having ordered the attack. He knew what happened to it. It was already reported what happened to him. While the length of this investigation is frustrating, it appears that an appropriate process is underway. And I am confident that if the officer is found to have the negligence, Israel was to respond accordingly. The purpose of these investigations, as I have always said, is to ensure accountability for proper action, not to second guess, with the benefit of hindsight, commanders making difficult battlefield decisions. It has to be admitted that that is what it is. It is a battlefield. Then if that is and that if, if that context is removed or overlooked or conveniently avoided, then it's not black and white. I continue reading at uh, page 220, second last line. Although the Israeli evidence that has emerged since publication of our report doesn't negate the tragic loss of civilian life, I regret that our fact-finding mission did not have such evidence explaining the circumstances in which we said the villains in Gaza were targeted because it probably would have influenced our findings about intentionality. Would have influenced, probably would have influenced our findings about intentionality and war crimes. I move one, I jump, I skip one paragraph that highlights a portion, that's the underlying portion. The purpose of the Goldstone Report was never to prove a foregone conclusion against Israel. I insisted on changing the original mandate adopted by the Human Rights Council, which was skewed against Israel. I'm reading the fourth line from the end. I had hoped that our inquiry into all aspects of the Gaza conflict would begin a new era of even-handedness at the UN Human Rights Council, whose history of bias against Israel cannot be doubted in this. This is what Colston says here. Um, page 202. Indeed, our main recommendation was for each party to investigate transparently and in good faith the incidents referred to in our report. McGowan Davis has found that Israel has done this to a significant degree. Hamas has done nothing. At minimum, I hope that in the face of a clear finding that its members were committing serious war crimes, Hamas would curtail its rocket attacks. Sadly, that has not been the case. Hundreds more rockets and mortar rounds have been directed at civilian targets in southern Israel. That comparatively few Israelis have been killed by the unlawful rockets and mortar attacks from Gaza in no way minimizes the criminality. The UN Human Rights Council should condemn these heinous acts in the strongest terms. I move on to the next page, page 223, second paragraph, the underlying portion. The Palestinian Authority established an independent inquiry into our allegations of human rights abuses perpetrated by Fatah in the West Bank, especially against members of Hamas. Most of these, those allegations were confirmed by this inquiry. Regrettably, there has been no effort by Hamas in Gaza to investigate the, the, the allegations of its war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. And he concludes, only if all parties to our conflict are held to these standards will we be able to protect civilians who, through no choice of their own, are caught up in wars. Goldstone also wrote um, another article in the New York Times. It, um, it is, 
It can be found at the back of the uh, submissions at page number 12. Starts at page number 12. And this is on the allegation that Israel, uh, Israel is an apartheid state. And he had this to say, and Richard Goldstone is from South Africa, so he should know a thing or two about apartheid. Now, in Israel, there is no apartheid. Nothing comes close to the definition of apartheid under the 1998 Rome Statute, quote, in acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed to the intention of maintaining that regime, unquote. Israeli Arabs, 20% of Israel's population, vote, have political parties and representatives in the Knesset and occupy positions of the place, including on its supreme court. Arab patients lie alongside Jewish patients in Israeli hospitals receiving identical treatment. I move on now to the issue of water. On the issue of water, I have only one point to make. Really. I refer to my bundle 6 at page 174. This is a report from the Ma'an, the Ma'an News Agency. Now, um, the Ma'an News Agency, uh, it can be found at page 175, uh, was launched in 2005. The Ma'an News Agency, MNA, publishes news around the clock in Arabic and English and is among the most browsed websites in the Palestinian territories. The next paragraph, Ma'an Network is the largest independent TV, radio, and online media group in the West End and Gaza Strip. The report, specifically at page 174, it reads, it's a short report, so I read the whole thing. Gaza opens first Olympic size swimming pool. This was a report from 2010. May the 18th. The report, Gaza's first Olympic standard swimming pool was inaugurated at the Ah Sadaka Club during a ceremony on Tuesday held by the Islamic Society. Gaza government ministers, members of the Palestinian Legislative Council, leaders of Islamic and national governing bodies, as well as club members and athletes were among those at the opening ceremony, where Secretary General of the Islamic Society, Nassim Yassin, thanked the donors who helped realize the project. Yassin praised the Astadaka Club for a number of wins in international and regional football, volleyball, and table tennis, and I think it's a bit off matches. Astadaka athletes perform a number of swimming exercises in the new pool to mark its opening. I shall leave it at that. The wall. When the, when the issue of the wall comes up, first thing that is always mentioned is there's an ICJ decision against the right. And the ICJ will go against Israel. Right. But what is less known is that there are two decisions by the Israeli Supreme Court, whether or not it was recognized, but I think it was. That, but there are two decisions by the Israeli Supreme Court on the issue of the wall. And I'm using the wall in inverted commas because apparently it's not a wall throughout. It's, it's, it's not like the Great Wall of China where it looks pretty much the same at any portion you visit. And it actually has a structure, it has a system, the towers, and it's not like that. At, at some portions it's a wall, wall very imposing wall, I have to admit, and at certain portions it's a fence and barbed wires. Um, excuse me. Uh, so, the chronology of the cases. The Israeli Supreme Court had the case of Betsori, B-E-I-T-S-O-U-R-I-K, that, that came first. Then the ICJ uh, case was sandwiched in between that. 
And then after that was the Israeli Supreme Court case of Marafe. Okay. So uh, the two Israeli Supreme Court decisions can be found on bundle number six. The case of the sorry can be found at page number one all the way to page 47 and the case of Marabe is at page 48 all the way to page 113. I will just, um, if I may, uh, quote the, uh, the, the, the important parts from the two cases that would explain is Israel's uh, the, the position that has been held by the Israeli Supreme Court on the, this issue of the war. First, I turn to page 16 of the bundle, and that is at um, page, this, this, this was that, sorry, paragraph 28. We examine petitioner's arguments and have come to con the conclusion, based upon the facts before us, that offense is motivated by security concerns. I continue, paragraph 29. The commander of the area detailed his consideration for the choice of the route. He noted the necessity of the defense pass through territory that topographically controls its surrounding, that in order to allow surveillance of it, its route be as flat as possible, and that a security zone be established which will delay infiltration into Israel. Delay infiltration. These are security considerations par excellence. In an, affidavit, in an additional affidavit, Major General Kublinski testified that, quote, it is not a permanent fence, but rather a temporary fence directed for security needs, unquote. We have no reason to give, not to give this testimony less than full weight, and we have no reason not to believe the sincerity of the military commander, yes, Trump, as much as one for those who would want to love at this point. This is also echoed in the statement of Ariel Sharon at the time, who said that a fence is not a political border. It is not a security border, but rather another means to assist the war against terror and greatly assist in stopping illegal aliens. Um, could you start by the use of the word alien? Uh, Are the I don't people know. on the other side of the fence aliens? I don't know. This was uh, taken from the Guardian Sharon Sands. I'm sorry, I have to probably go to the context of it. What is the defense position of to the Palestinians who are on the other side of the fence? Are they aliens? The asylum foundation. Okay, it's a very significant issue. Yeah. There are Palestinians on this side of the wall. And fence that Palestinians on the other side are the aliens. And the foreigners are, are they on their own land. We have to understand your point of view. And what is your position? Is the, is the defense position that the Palestinians on the other side of the border, on the side of the fence, are aliens? Just, I, mean, I think you have to make, a, you have to make up your mind on that. Legally, that um, an alien is someone who is not permitted to cross a border, and, and an alien is a non-citizen. All right. So, are Palestinians aliens? No, they're not. Really. No. In that case, are you setting? Are you abandoning the evidence they, that you're bringing on that question? No, they can be occupied. They can be occupied people, and as we've seen, at aliens, the the the, the legal use of aliens is someone who has no citizenship. That is how they are described in official documents. I'm referring to the use in that you made of it in the quote. Again, um, as a quote, as it stands, it is not a um, security border. It's a, mean, it's a means to assist in the war terror. Um, if we, if we, if we you may have, you might have to, I may have to. I think what we need to know is, are you citing it as, 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 as something that you're citing or are you adopting it? Mm -hmm. but I, that, that's all. To illustrate the uh, yeah. uh, Betsori point. Betsori, 
play some competition, whether it's accepted or not, after the tribunal, that the wall in the commerce is based on security considerations. I move now to the case of Marabe, which was decided after the ICJ decision. I turn to bundle number six, page 62. Is, uh, are you honest with me on this? Thank you. Okay, I'm reading from page, uh, from paragraph 21. The second reason which justifies our conclusion that the military commander is authorized to order the construction of a separation fence intended to protect the lives and ensure the security of the Israeli settlers in, this, in the area is this. The Israelis living in the area are Israeli citizens. The state of Israel has a duty to defend their lives, safety, and well-being. I skip a few pages now to page 73. Paragraph 37, six lines from the end of paragraph 37, I'm reading. Two questions stood before the ICJ. The first question was whether it has jurisdiction to give the requested opinion, and if the answer to that question is positive, are there reasons not to exercise that jurisdiction? The second question was the question posed to it by the General Assembly on the merits. Skipping ahead to page 86 of the bundle, paragraph 63. This comments on the ICJ decision by the Israeli Supreme Court. The security military necessity is only mentioned, is mentioned only most minimally in the sources upon which the ICJ based its opinion. Only one line is devoted to it in the Secretary General's report, stating that the decision to erect a fence was made due to a new rise in Palestinian terrorism in the spring of 2002. In his written statement, the security military consideration is not mentioned at all. In the Dugard report and the Ziegler report, there are no data on this issue at all. In Israel's written statement to the ICJ regarding jurisdiction and discretion, data regarding the terrorism and its repercussions were presented, but these did not find their way to the opinion itself. This minimal factual basis is manifest, of course, in the opinion itself. It contains no real mention of the security-military aspect. If I may, at this point, I have a few photo four photographs to illustrate the wall. Right. The first is um, okay, this. The first is a compilation of victims of as headed victims of suicide attacks before and after security defense. So, in 2003, in the areas with the fence, 46 were killed and 221 were wounded. In 2003, in areas without the fence, 89 were killed and 411 were wounded. Between the, time, the periods of January to June 2004, in areas with the fence, nobody was killed, nobody was wounded. In areas without the fence, 19 were killed and 102 were wounded. Could we move to the next? Uh, this is not that clear, but um, it shows what the fence looks like at some portions. So it's we could say it's the wall slash fence, but I'm, I will use the term the wall in inverted commas. Next, some portions of it look like this. And the final, and the final. Now, and this illustrates why there's a need for a wall to prevent sniper fires. Because a sniper fire would, a wall would keep the, keep 
uh, reduce the line of sight of the sniper with the rifle. Thank you. Um, so now I come to the elephant in the room, which I had already uh, attempted. <laughs> which had already uh, alluded to just now, very emphatically. Um, suicide bombings protect our citizens. Self-defense is, is an issue. Does Israel have a right to self-defense? And, um, uh, what about human shields being used? Okay. Um, on this, um, they can, they, they, I will refer mainly to the uh, bundles five and six. Um, I'll try to go as fast as I can through these materials. But they are before the court, and I hope uh, the tribunal has had a look at them and the parts that I have underlined, um, to illustrate, uh, which I have underlined in my book to illustrate the point that I'm making. Now, um, the first is I'm referring to bundle number five at page two two seven. Now, of course, this uh, this 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 can be disputed. I understand, but. I present them as they are. Most of the uh, authorities I cite about the cases or articles, the uh, source can be found. The, you are, uh, the URL source can be found at the top. At page two to seven, um, this is a comprehensive listing of fatalities, and it goes all the way to the present, and it goes all the way back to goes all the way back to August. 30th, 1999. So uh, it lists down all the terrorist attacks and it goes all the way to page 252. This is the list of fatalities in Israel. If I may just highlight a few uh, uh, instances. As listed in November 11th of 2013, um, there was a private, of course, he's in the army. Rabbi Adam Atias was killed after being stabbed in the neck by a 16-year-old Palestinian. On the 30th of April 2013, a father of five stabbed to death at a bus stop. The Palestinian was 24 years old from Tukang, who then stole Borowski's pistol and began firing at a police border police checkpoint after which he was incapacitated by soldiers. I move on to page 228. Just taking random, uh, just taking the ones that, uh, that, that are, that just popped up to me. In 2011, September 23rd, the father and one-year-old son were killed when their car careened after being struck by stones. So, here is indicated stones thrown by Palestinians. On August 18, 2011, five citizens were killed when terrorists opened fire on passenger bus. They were killed when they were in a passenger bus. April 7, 2011, anti-tank missiles was fired at a school bus. And I think the most the most horrific one is the one the one that I have highlighted, March 11, 2011. The Fogel family, where um, mother and father and three children were stabbed to death in their home in Itma, uh, the northern West Bank, on Shabbat night. Yeah. Anyone who does a little bit of criminal law will know that stabbing is a personal way of violence. The list is there. I put it as it is. I will continue uh, with uh, the same bundle at bundle number 5, page 253. 